Okay, and we're going to start with question number one. Now, on 2.8, these are our applications. And many of these applications are going to require us to draw a diagram. And we really have to understand what the question is wanting us to do. So, question number one. If there are 6,380 businesses in financial trouble, if this represents 21% of all businesses, what is the total number of businesses? And we want to round to the nearest whole number. Okay, now, how do we set this up? Well, let's think about what we've got. We want to use that 21%. 21% is 0 0.21 as a decimal, right? Okay, so whenever we talk about percentages and we go to work with percentages, first thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure we write it as a decimal. We don't ever use percentages as they are. We rewrite them as a decimal. Now, what do we know about that 6,380? That is 21% of the total. So 6,380 is 21% of the total. Now, what do we know about the total? We don't know the total number of businesses, so we're going to let X be the total number of businesses. And how does that 6,380 relate to the total number of businesses? Again, it's 21%, right? So if I take 21%, which is 0 0.12 of the total number of businesses, X, that is going to give me 6,380, right? Because that's what that means. We write it out in words, that X would be the total number of businesses. Now, we can finish that by simply doing what? By simply dividing by the 0 0.21. And what does that give you now for your value of x here? We've got 6,380. We're going to divide that by 0 0.21. Okay. And that gives us now, uh, it says round to the nearest whole number. So that gives us 30,000. Three hundred, and it looks like eighty-one businesses total. Right, because that's how many total businesses that we have. Okay, does everyone see what we did there? Now, twenty-one percent. What was that? Twenty-one percent of the total. So, we let X be the total number of businesses, which we don't know, and we, but we know it's going to be. A larger number right now we know that we probably did it correctly because that's quite a bit larger than what quite a bit larger than the 6380 that we started with okay, so all we had to do was divide our number should be larger if our number was smaller we know that we made a mistake just common sense tells us that it's going to be bigger than that 3000 or sorry 6380 question two A woman has a dollar seventy in dimes and nickels. She has five more dimes than nickels. How many nickels does she have? Well, let's see what we've got here. We're going to make a diagram. And I'm going to use dollar signs to represent these coins. Okay, so this is coins. And we're going to look at the value of each coin. Now, what type of coins do we have? We have nickels, right? And we have dimes. So the nickels are 5%. We'll call those, we'll do that one first. So 0 0.05, that's the value of the nickels. 10 cents is the dimes, so that's 0 0.1. Okay, that's the value of those coins. Now, we don't know how many total coins that we have, 
But what do we know? It says she has five more dimes than nickels. So five more dimes than nickels. So when I talk about the nickels, do I know how many nickels I have here? No. So that's going to be X. Number of coins is unknown. X. Okay. We don't know how many nickels that we have, so we use an X there. Now, what about the number of dimes? There's five more, right? Okay, so five more dimes than nickels. So that wouldn't just be five, that would be X plus what? Five. Okay, if I add those, how many total coins do I have when I add across? When I add across, that gives you 2X plus what? Okay, is everyone okay with that? There's the nickels, five cents, unknown number of coins, because we don't know. We've got dimes. Dimes are worth 10 cents, okay? Don't know how many, but we do know that there are five more. We add across, and it gives you the total number of coins. Now, what about my total value here? Of all the coins put together. Okay, the total value of all the coins put together is what? $1.70. And how do I find my total value? That's going to be the number of coins, right, times the value of the coin. So let's look at our nickels. Okay. Nickels are worth five cents a piece, so that's 0 0.05. Five cents. And do we know how many nickels that we have? No. So that's unknown. That's x. What about the dimes? Okay. We don't know how many dimes we have, but dimes are going to be worth 10 cents. So that's 0 0.1. And how many dimes do we have? X plus 5. Okay. And what's the total value of all the coins? All the coins, when I put all the coins together, that gives me $1.70. Is everyone okay with how I got to that point? Okay. Because we've got nickels, we've got dimes. We don't know how many nickels. Okay, so that's unknown. They're worth five cents a piece. Dimes, we know there's five more. So we have to use that X plus five. Okay, and they're worth 10 cents a piece. We really didn't need the total coins, but I went ahead and found it. Then we look at our value of the coins. So how do we find our value? Okay, value is how much the coins are worth times how many we had. So, dimes. If I had 10 dimes, how much money would that be? That would be a dollar, right? Why? Dimes are 10 cents. Multiply them together. That's going to give you then a dollar. We can now quickly finish this. It's been a while, so we'll just go ahead and review how we solve this. First thing we do is we distribute through. So, that's 0.05x plus 0.1x plus 0 0.5, that equals $1.70. Now, if we're solving equations, what do we do next? Well, before we move things across the equal sign, we need to make sure that we combine our like terms together. So those can go together for the x's. And that gives you now a 0.15x plus 0.5 equals $1.70. We're going to move that 0 0.5 over. Make sure we're careful with those decimals now. And that gives me 0.15x. On the other side, $1.70 minus 50 cents gives you $1.20. Divide by our 0 0.15. Now we have x, and what does x come out to give you? Okay. x is going to be $1.20 divided by that 0.15, and that gives you 8. Now, what do we want? It says, how many nickels do we have? What does x go with? The x goes with the number of nickels, so we have 8 nickels.
Does it make sense how we got there? Now we could also get the dimes. It doesn't ask for it. But we could plug it back in and get the dimes because there's five more. And x plus five, well, eight plus five would give you 13 dimes. And how would you check? If you wanted to check this, okay, nickels are worth five cents a piece. So if I've got eight nickels, that's eight times five cents. That comes out to be 40 cents. Dimes are worth 10 cents a piece. That's $1.30. When I add them together, what do I get? $1.70. And that makes sense, doesn't it? You don't have to check them, but you can see that if we did, we would have eight nickels. Now, how did I get the 13 dimes? Dimes is what? Five more, so that's x plus five there, which is eight plus five, which gives you then the 13. Question three. For question three, we've got a pie chart. And this one is just going to be reading the pie chart and interpreting these percentages. So about how many students would you expect to prefer films in a school of 850 students? So we've got a pie chart with these different percentages. And what are we looking for here? All right, we are looking for films. And when we look for films, films is 20%. So 20% of the students prefer films. Now, how many total students do I have? Well, if I read that question, the total number of students I have is going to be 850, right? Now, how many of them prefer film? 20%. So how do I figure out how many students would rather see a film than anything else? We just simply take our 850 and 20% as a decimal. What is that? 0 0.2. So we take our 850, multiply that by our, our 20% or 0 0.2, and that then comes out to give you 170 students. Some questions are quite a bit easier than others. This one doesn't require us to make a diagram or anything else. It's just simply reading that pie chart and understanding that we want 20% of the 850. So that takes care now of question three. Uh, question four is a little bit different. Question four is kind of like question two in a way. So it's very, very similar to question two. Uh, question four says, a merchant has coffee that is worth $30 a pound and we want to mix it with 30 pounds of coffee that's worth $80 a pound and we want to get a mixture that can be sold for $40 a pound how many pounds of the $30 coffee should be used so this is a classic mixture question this is something you'll see in intermediate it's a very common type of problem so when we look at this, we're looking at different coffees. Now, instead of having coins like question two, we've got pounds of coffee. And instead of having the, the value of the coins, right, we've got the value of the coffee per pound. So let's see what we've got here. We're looking at different types of coffees. And we're going to mix these coffees together to make a blend. So we want to make a blend of coffee. And so we're going to start by looking at number of pounds of coffee and then the cost or the value of the coffee. We'll just say cost. You could also say value, just as long as you keep track of things. So when we read this, what do we have first? Okay, a merchant has coffee worth $30 a pound. So we've read that. Now, what do we know? 
we know that we have coffee that costs $30 a pound. Does it specifically tell me how many pounds of that $30 coffee that I have? No, right? That, that other 30 does not go with it. It says, I've got some coffee that's worth $30 a pound. So I don't know how much of this coffee I have. So I use an X there, right? That's our unknown coffee. I am then going to mix that with 30 pounds of coffee that sells for $80 a pound. So this is going to be mixed with 30 pounds of coffee. And that new coffee, it's a more expensive coffee, it sells for $80 a pound. Now we're going to add a cross for our pounds. So how many pounds total do I have? When I add a cross, well, that's going to be x plus 30. And I want to mix these together, and I want this mixture to sell for what? How much pound? Okay, it says it sells for $40 a pound. So that's going to go over here with my 40. Okay, so what do I have? I've got some coffee that's worth $30 a pound. So I've got my coffee made up over here. I want to blend that together with some $80 coffee. Maybe it's some kind of coffee that I have I need to get rid of. It's $80 a pound. I've got 30 pounds of it. I want to blend it together, mix it all together, so I can sell that blend for $40 a pound. So we don't know how much $30 coffee we have. We've got 30 pounds of $80 coffee, and we want to mix them together to get something that sells for $40. Now we can go ahead and work with our total cost. And the total cost is going to be the number of pounds times the cost of that coffee. So let's look at our first one. First one, we just multiply together. Very, very similar to question two. Almost identical. These get multiplied together. So that gives you 30x. The next one, what do we have? 80 times 30. And then what about the last one on the right-hand side? That's part three. And on the right-hand side, we have 40 times x plus 30. So that's what we've got. Now we can go ahead and uh, combine this together. So 80 times that 30, that coffee costs 2400 And we still have our 30x there. On the other side, we're going to distribute that 40 through, which then that gives you 40x and 40 times 30. It makes it 1200 is everyone all right with that so far? Now, when we solve, just to review ourselves on how to solve, when we solve, what do we do? We get the variable by itself on the left-hand side. Okay, so, it doesn't matter which way we go first, whether we move the numbers first or the variables first. I'm going to go ahead and move that 2400 over. That way it's, it's moving over. And that leaves me now with... 30x equals 40x minus 1,200. Now what do we need to do? We move that 40x over with subtraction. Now we've got a minus 10x equals a minus 1,200. We'll divide by a negative 10. And negative over negative is going to make that positive. And that comes out to be 120. And what does that 120 represent? That represents the number of pounds of $30 coffee. So I need 120 pounds of $30 coffee. That's what I would mix with the 80 pounds, and that's going to give me then a $40 a pound mixture. So that's going to give me the blend that I want. 
And this is something you're going to see in intermediate. You will see all these type of questions again. Very, very similar to these. The coin problem and the coffee problem. Just a little bit different, but same concepts. Okay, question nine. We need to think about how we would set this up. And how these, these, these two kids relate to each other. So Derek is four times as old as Sarah. Two years ago, the sum of their ages was 36. How old is each right now? Well, let's see how they relate to each other right now. Okay, so what do we know about Derek and Sarah right now? That first sentence. Derek, okay, is four times as old as Sarah. So that means Derek, and we'll just write this up in words, is going to be four times Sarah, right? Now, do we know what Sarah's age is right now? No. So this is right now, currently. We don't know her age right now, so we're going to use an X there. So that means when I rewrite that, and this is right now, Derek, with the variable X, is going to be 4 times Sarah's age, so that would be 4X, and Sarah is X. Okay, is everyone okay with how I did that? So, I did not even deal with the two years ago yet. That is something we're going to deal with next. So, currently, as of right now, Derek is four times as old as Sarah. So Sarah is going to be the variable X. That means Derek will be four times Sarah's age. Now, we have to worry about the next part, which is two years ago. Now, what's going to happen two years ago? Well, each one of them is going to be two years younger, right? So, Derek right now is 4X, but Derek four years ago, or sorry, two years ago would be 4X minus what? Two. And what about Sarah? Yep, that's going to be two years younger, X minus two. Okay, so we had to break it up into now... And then we had to look at it in terms of two years ago. And now how do they relate together? It says two years ago, the sum of their ages was 36. So we're going to work with the two years ago. And two years ago, we know that Derek plus Sarah is going to equal 36. So that tells me then we use the two years ago tells me then that Derek is going to be 4x minus 2. Sarah was x minus 2, and that equals my 36. Now we've got it, right? Now we can build our equation, and now we can solve it. Before we move things across the equal bar, always combine first. 4x and x can go together. That's going to make that 5x, and a negative 2. And another negative 2, well, that makes it a negative 4, and that equals my 36. We're almost finished. We're going to add 4 to each side. And that leaves you then with 5x equals 40. We'll divide by our 5. And what is x going to come out to be? Well, x should be 8, isn't it? Because 40 divided by 5 comes out to be 8. Now, what do we want? We want to know how old is each right now. Okay, so we want to know how old is each right now. Okay. Well, Derek, Derek was 4x, so that would be 4 times 8. So as of right now, Derek is what? 4 times 8, which is that 
32. So currently Derek is 32 years old. And what about Sarah? Sarah was X. Okay, and what's X come out to be? 8. And that's the answers that we need. How could we check? If we wanted to check. Okay, well, two years ago, what should they add up to give you? 36. So, two years ago, Derek would have been 30. Two years ago, Sarah would have been 6. 30 plus 6, that gives you your 36. So, it all makes sense, and it all goes together. Next, we're going to look at inequalities. Now, when we talk about inequalities in 2.9, when we talk about inequalities, we need to review the, the way we graph these on the number line. So this is 2.9, and let's review a little bit about inequalities. Strictly less than, strictly greater than, those get parentheses, Greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, those get square brackets. And positive or negative infinity always get parentheses. Okay, so those are just the things we need to remember when we go to graph these on our number line. Another important factor to remember is when we divide by a negative, that flips your inequality. So when we divide by a negative, remember that is going to flip that inequality around. So we're going to work through some of these, and I picked these out. I picked ones to make us review things a bit. We're going to look at question three. Now, when we go to solve these, we work them out the same way that we would any other. When we solve for this, it's an inequality, so we have to get the variable again on the left numbers on the right. So nothing new, it's just that instead of having an equal bar, we have an inequality symbol. But it's going to behave the same way. So first thing we need to do is make sure we combine like terms. So the 4 and the 3 can go together. And that leaves me then with 13t plus 7 is greater than or equal to 12t plus 5. Now, solve it the same way we would with an equals. It's no different. So what do we need to do? We need to move the 7 to over. So let's get rid of that. And that leaves me then with a 13t is greater than or equal to 12t minus 2. And we'll move that 12t over. Nothing new. 13t minus 12t, that leaves you with a single t. And t is greater than or equal to 2. Now, we do need to graph this on our number line. And then we're going to write our answer in interval notation. So on the number line, we find our negative 2. So we're going to put the negative 2 somewhere. So there's going to be our negative 2. Now, which way does it point? This is the easiest way to remember how to graph these. Which way does it point? Okay. It points to the right, doesn't it? So that means we shade to the right. And when we go to the right, well, that's positive infinity. And since we have a greater than or equal to or a less than or equal to, that is then going to give us square brackets. 
So how would we express our answer in interval notation? Well, it's square bracket negative 2. And where does it go to? Positive infinity. And infinity always, always, no matter what, gets parentheses. So all we did was we moved things around. We didn't flip our inequality symbol because the only time we flip our inequality symbol is when we divide by a negative. Now, I picked question four for us to look at as well, because question four, we're going to be working with the picture, and we're going to be coming up with our inequality. So question four, you got this diagram here. And I want to write this with the variable x. So first thing I do is I need to write down my x here. And which way is it going? Okay. It is going to the left. So which way does my interval have to point? Or my, my inequality have to point? The same way. If it's going to the left, it points to the left. So we're going to use that x is less than. And what is x less than? Negative 6. Now, why did I use less than? Because strictly less than or strictly greater than, those get the parentheses. So it points to the left. It is shaded to the left. That's how you remember which way it goes. Whichever way it points is the way that you shade. Um, question five, I just want you to write this with the variable x. And all this is, is just writing up your inequality. So let's read it. And there's no calculations here. This one is nothing more than coming up with my inequality. Ethan could spend at most... All right, so that's very important there. At most, 60 minutes per day playing video games. So at most. Now, what does at most mean? At most means that's the most that I could spend. So it's got to be basically that or less. So how would you write this one? At most. We've got X here. Okay. And at most means we want it to be less. So x is going to be less than or equal to, in this case, 60. Right? Because you can't spend any more than 60 minutes on that game a day. Which way would this be shading? Back to the left. Where are smaller numbers? Back to the left. Numbers smaller than 60 are back to the left. couple more and then we'll take a short break uh, someone did ask about question nine and we're gonna try to set up question nine uh-huh yep uh, we can go ahead and work that one out question six it's very easy to do 5x is less than 25 right and they don't give you um, any room to get the graph, but they wanted an interval notation. I always like to graph them, and then I can get the interval notation from that picture. So we want to solve this, so we'll divide it by 5. So x is here. Inequality stays the same. 25 divided by 5, well, that is a 5. Okay. On the number line, which way is it going? It's pointing to the left. Strictly less than, so it's going to look like that, isn't it? And when it goes to the left, where does it go to? Negative infinity. So what would that look like? Negative infinity. And where does it stop at? Positive 5. So that would be the answer that we're actually looking for right here in interval notation. But we do need to draw the graph to make it easier. And you can do without drawing the graph. I think drawing the graph... You can see it. Just make sure the pieces go in the correct order. Okay. 
Question nine is the only real difficult one to set up. So we need to come up with our profit, our revenue, and our cost. A company that produces appliances has found that the revenue from the sales of appliances is $50 per appliance, less a sales cost of $200. Production costs are $350 plus $40 per appliance. The profit is given by the revenue minus the cost. So part A, write an expression for the revenue R, letting X represent the production level, the number of appliances produced. So what do we know about our revenue? When we read it, it says that your revenue is $50 per appliance less a sales cost of what? 200. So R is going to be our revenue. And what would that look like as an expression? Well, R is our revenue. And these appliances, I make $50 off of each one. So that's going to be 50X less the $200 I have to spend on. Maybe that's advertisements. So I spend $200 one time and I make $50 off of each appliance. What about part B? What about the cost? Okay, cost is a little bit different. Production costs are 350 plus $40 per appliance. So what would that look like? 350 plus 40x, so we'll just write that as 40x plus 350. Is that 350? Well, that might be something like maybe the cost of the machine. Whatever it might be, I spend $350 one time and then $40 to make each appliance. Part C. Write an expression for the profit, and then solve the inequality with your profit greater than zero. Well, my profit is going to be the revenue minus the cost. So what would that look like? Well, that would be 50x minus 200 minus the cost, which the cost is 40x plus 350 there, right? going to distribute that negative sign through. And we now have 50x minus 200 minus 40x. Negative and, neg sorry, negative and positive makes it a negative 350. So when I combine them together, that gives me 10x, right? Because those can go together. And a minus 200. And a minus 350, well, that gives me a minus 550. Now, we also want to solve your profit greater than zero, right? So we want to solve that profit greater than zero. So let's go ahead and Fill in our inequality. So we've got 10x minus 550 is greater than 0. We're going to add our 550 to each side. So 10x is greater than 550. We'll divide by our 10. And now we know that x is going to be greater than what? 55, right? Part D. Part D says, describe the solution in terms of the problem. So we've got x to be greater than 55, right? 
Now, what does that mean? That means, in terms of everything that we've looked at, that means I must sell at least, well, you can either say at least, or we'll just say, okay, this is going to be X is greater than 55, so we could say at least 56 appliances to make a profit. Or you could say more than 55, same thing. You can say, I must sell more than 55, right? Or at least 56. They mean the same thing. More than 55 and at least 56 are the same. But as long as I sell at least those 56 appliances, I make a profit. If I don't sell that many appliances, I lose money, and I don't want to do that. So that's how you set that one up. We've got two more to look at, and then we'll take a short break. Question 10. The formula for converting a Fahrenheit temperature to a Celsius temperature is given. If a bottle of prescription medicine has to be kept below 12 degrees Celsius, how would you describe this warning using the Fahrenheit temperature? Okay. So, Right now, we have 35 degrees Celsius, and we want the Fahrenheit temperature. Now, we know that C equals 5 ninths times F minus 32. And we know our, our Celsius temperature, and what's our Celsius temperature? Okay, our Celsius temperature is 35. So we're going to plug that in. We don't know the Fahrenheit temperature, so that's going to be our unknown. But I am going to go ahead and distribute that 5 ninths through. So that's going to give me 5 ninths F minus. Okay, how do we work with this here? We've got 5 ninths times a minus 32 over 1. We multiply across. <coughs> so we've got 5 times a negative 32. That's a minus 160 over 9. Okay, so that's what we've got there. Now, how do we solve this? Well, to solve this, we need to clear our fractions. So what's our only denominator? 9. So we're going to multiply everything by a 9. And 35 times that 9, that's a 315. 9's cancel, that leaves you with a 5x. 9's cancel, that leaves you with a 160. Let's go ahead and convert this. So go ahead and finish it by adding 160 to each side. I'm going to rewrite it with the 5x on the left because I like a variable on the left. And we've got 315 plus that 160. It's 475. We'll divide by our 5. And what does that give me for the Fahrenheit temperature? That gives me now Fahrenheit temperature of 95, doesn't it? And what does that mean? Okay, now, what, what does the original medicine say? The original medicine says this prescription is to be kept below what? 35 degrees Celsius. So I converted it to Fahrenheit. So what would my new directions look like? 
It would look like this medicine must be kept below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's it, right? We converted it from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and our new directions on that bottle would be this medicine must be kept below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. One more, and then we'll take a short break. So we're going to look at question 12. And this should be a pretty quick question. And then we'll take a short break. So question 12 here. Now, for question 12, we're looking at a rectangle. And here's our rectangle. And I want that perimeter to be at least 152. So what do we know about the perimeter? Okay, let's remember what the perimeter is. Perimeter is going to be sum of all the sides, right? Remember that? If I have a perimeter of any figure, Perimeter is always the same, and it is always summing of all the sides. So we want to sum up all the sides. So let's see what we've got. If I look at my perimeter, let's find it first. If I look at my perimeter, I've got 3x plus 2. I've got another 3x plus 2. I've got a 6x plus 11 and another 6x plus 11. Right? You have to add all four sides of this rectangle up. And now when we add all these together, how many x's do I have? I have 3x, another 3x. That makes it 6 plus 12 more. That makes it 18x. And number-wise, I have a 2, another 2, that's 4, plus 11, and another 11, that's plus 22. And that comes out to give you 26. Is everyone okay with how I got that? Okay, that's the perimeter. Now, what do we want? We want the perimeter... to be at least 52. So what would that look like if I rewrote it? Oh, sorry, 152. Yep, you're right there. Okay, 152. So I want that perimeter to be at least 152. And so if I rewrite this, my perimeter has to be greater than 152. What do we know about our perimeter? We did that, and that was 18x plus 26. And now we can finish it, right? So we can finish this out. So then move that 26 over with subtraction. And we've got 152 minus that 26. That's 126 here. Divide by our 18. And we now know that x has to be greater than 7. I'm going to go ahead and put this in interval notation. So on the number line, here's my 7. Which way is it going? Okay, it says greater than 7. It's pointing to the right, so we shade to the right. And it gets a parenthesis there, and it goes to positive infinity. So, in terms of interval notation, this would look like parentheses 7. And where does it go to? Positive infinity. Okay, let's take a short break, and we'll come back, and we'll finish up this section. So, let's...